Hi, everyone, and welcome to tonight's panel where we will be featuring Adam Bazark as well as some other members of his company, and they will be teaching us about directing the creative tree. And on that note, we will let Bazark go ahead and take it over. Hi, everyone. Um, we are the Bazark Company. Uh, we are here in Glendale, California, and we are so excited to be here with you today. And we want to send out a big thank you to the TEA at USC for asking us to come and talk with you. My name is Shanna Collins. I work in creative development at the Bees Art Company. And we're going to spend some time talking about creative teams, creative team building within the industry. We're also looking forward to connecting with all of you with some questions at the end and seeing how all the information that we're gonna share can help you move forward and build your careers. So without any further ado, I would love to pass the baton over to my fellow team members here at the Bizarre Company. Adam? Uh, I'll go last. You guys go oh, first. Uh, Baz, you go. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Baz. I'm the lead creative director at the Bizarre Company. And I think that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Hi, I'm Diana O'Rourke. I'm a senior producer at the Bizarre Company. How about Lex? Hi, my name is Lex Rhodes. I'm a creative coordinator with the Bizarre Company. I'm Esty, um, and I'm a project coordinator. Susan Beth. And I'm Susan Beth Smith, and I am the executive producer, and I had to lie down, so just forgive me for my positioning here. And apparently Joe Garlington's pants are here tonight as well. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're, we're accompanying Joe on a, on a tour of his home. To, I our, love the surfboard. And uh, Joe, you guys all probably know Joe. Joe is uh, a, an honorary Bizarre, a longtime collaborator and friend of ours and uh, gave me some of my first work in the biz and we, we do stuff together now, and we teach at the class with Joe. So we're really glad he's here tonight. There, you didn't have to say anything, Joe. Because <laughs> you're because you're muted. So should we? Uh, shall we start? We can tell you uh, a little bit about what we're about. Um, first of all, hi everybody, and thanks. We're really glad y'all are here. Um, it's uh, it's nice to see folks. I don't. It's uh, it, it, this is a little different than Zoom calls because we, you can see us, but we cannot see you. So we're sort of you're looking, watching us through one of those one-way mirrors in the uh, in the detective at the police station where they grill the the suspects, and we'll be we'll be uh, performing uh, blind for you now. But we will have time to talk afterwards, take questions, and all that. So thanks for having us. This is really fun. Um, we want to talk to you guys, you know, tell you guys a little bit about ourselves. We don't know. Uh, some of you here may know us well. Some of you may have uh, never heard of us. So we just kind of want to give you a, a real fast overview about who we are. And then we can kind of get into the stuff we wanted to talk about today. Uh, our company is, uh, like Shanna said, we're located in Glendale in beautiful Atwater Village. We're right near Disney and Universal. And we do a lot of work. Uh, for those guys, as well as all over the world, uh, we have a we are a small but mighty company of about 20, 20 brainy people who are able to conceive to work creatively and practically to create amazing stuff all over the world. Our focus is on creative leadership and on creating um, content, attractions, rides, shows, uh, spectaculars. Uh, parades, fireworks, and 3D movies. We're not architects. We're not master planners. We don't design the buildings, but we do work with architects and master planners as sort of story master planners to figure out what the story of a theme park might be, what the different lands would be. And then we sort of go to town and develop the rides, the shows, and all the good stuff on the inside. Um, so uh, we've done work, uh, we've been around for years doing things uh, both before I had formally started the company and then since 
we started up a few years ago, going all the way back to Illuminations at Epcot, which is sort of the first thing I ever directed when I was about three years old, and all the way up to Pirates of the Caribbean at Shanghai Disneyland, where I was involved in the creative team and wrote the show. And uh, also stuff for Universal, including Terminator 2 3D and the Jaws ride and the Spider-Man ride and the Ghostbusters show. And uh, we've worked on museum projects like Space Shuttle Atlantis at Kennedy Space Center. And we're currently doing stuff all over the world, including in Asia, including a really cool Planet of the Apes 3D ride that's coming to a a theme park in Malaysia soon. And we're uh, currently, a lot of the folks that you're gonna see today are working on a really amazing uh, cross between a gigantic, the world's biggest aquarium and a theme, theme park indoors. It's sort of an aquarium plus entertainment plus adventure and show and live animal exhibits to make a whole new kind of uh, marine life experience. And we're involved in that. That'll be opening next year and we're uh, in the, about to send some of the folks you're seeing today over to China in the weeks ahead to uh, do the final implementation of that. Uh, and just because it's Halloween, we'd like to point out that we sometimes do special events, including we uh, did a, an amazing, wonderful Halloween event at the White House uh, for the previous occupant of the White House, not the current occupant. And uh, it was an amazing experience that none of us will forget. We decorated the inside and the outside and they had a special effects and illusions and it was really fun so we do live events we do parades we do you know kind of little of everything if it's if it's big and it's crazy and it blows up we like doing it and uh me since this is an alumnus thing i'll i can tell you two seconds about me and how we sort of got here um i i'm from chicago i i didn't grow up in california i was <laughs> i was born a, a dork as you can see uh but apparently had an early interest in thrill rides and um and i the the, the influences that i had growing up in chicago were all the entertainment things that were available in Chicago. Uh, and one of which was the amazing Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, where there were really cool exhibits like a coal mine that you could take our, uh, take an elevator into a coal mine and re ride a real mine train and see uh, animatronics, really crude animatronics of uh, coal miners. And this completely terrifying Paul Bunyan exhibit that was twice the size of little me. And I would look at it and be scared and I would got this sort of fascination with immersive experiences then. And I was doing every kind of dumb thing, building costumes, putting on shows, making movies in the backyard, building puppets. I might have been a, I might have worked for the Muppets uh, as a career if my family hadn't taken me to Disneyland when I was about 13 and blew my mind. And I, I had never been seen anything like it. And the probably like a lot of you, the thing that completely sold me was the Haunted Mansion. That sort of melted my mind in ways I couldn't even begin to explain, but you guys are probably familiar with. And I couldn't think about anything else or talk about anything else for the next 40 years, basically. And, um, and I decided I wanted to get into the theme park business. I wanted to be a theme park designer, but at the time there was only WED Enterprises, Disney Imagineering. There was no theme park industry to speak of. And nobody could tell me how to get into the theme park business or where to go to college to learn theme park design like some lucky little brats can do today. There was nothing like this back when I was a kid. So after much searching, I wound up going to USC where uh, fortunately they had, and I think still have, the sort of create your own major program, interdisciplinary degree program. And I wound up putting together pieces of architecture, film, cinema, theater, audio design, graphic design, anything I could get my hands on. Plus I got to do a field study at Disneyland where I'd go down one day a week and study different departments. And over time I started working in the business, but I, and I terribly sorry, but this is literally, I could not find a single picture thanks COVID, of anything from USC. It's all in a, at another location. So this is my one picture of USC. But uh, after graduating, uh, even though I wanted to work at Disney, I was, still wasn't quite qualified. So where did I wind up working? I wound up working at, as a tour guide at Universal Studios, giving tram tours and working in the special effects stage and sort of learning the tricks of the trade. And over time, I got to work on projects there. Then I got to do more stuff and more stuff. And then eventually started doing larger projects, including 
uh, Illuminations was my first big break and went on from there. And um, Joe Garlington helped me out early in my career and I directed uh, a film for him for the uh, LA Children's Zoo starring famed TV comedian, Miss Betty White. And that's me about a long time ago and on many pounds ago. And uh, like a lot of folks in our industry, I've kind of worked many different places from Imagineering to Universal. And then in the last seven or eight years, got together with this amazing team uh, with the help of Susan Beth Smith, who you'll hear from later, our executive producer. And we started really pulling together a wonderful team of folks who can kind of extend our reach and let us do bigger, cooler things. And that's what we're doing today. So that's our setup. That's our pre-show for the, today's attraction. The, now for the main ride. Uh, what we wanted to talk about today is what we're calling the creative tree. And we want to thank uh, 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 Kroos. Did you say Kroos or Cross? Uh, our your graphic designer for this amazing graphic, which we are going to completely steal and use from now on because we really liked it. Um, what we wanted to talk about is how do how do creative teams work? How, what's the, how are they organized? And how do you guys as students and next gen people coming into the industry find the right way to get into the business? Now, I wish I'd had anybody who would have told me that when I was a kid, nobody would. He just had to sort of figure it out. We really want to help people find their way to the right place in the in this industry. So um, we get a lot of questions from folks, people, we, we talk to students all the time. Susan Beth is talking to students all the time. All of us love hearing from students and love being part of the conversation about what's going on out there. And here's one of the questions we hear all the time. How can I be like you? How can, how can I become a creative director? And uh, my, I don't know about you, Susan Beth, but my answer is always, you're asking the wrong question. <laughs> Let's back up a little bit and talk a little bit more. Recently, though, I got a, uh, a message on LinkedIn from uh, a woman named Ariel Spencer, and she's in Florida. She's a next gen student, and she wrote this question, which I thought was great after we did a, P a, a TEA thing. And she said, um, I want to ask you about your advice to you tell us to learn as many things as possible, learn, learn all about the business. But I also get advice from people to be a specialist and focus on one thing. I was wondering, you know, how do you reconcile those two things? And that is an interesting question. And that kind of led us that question, should I be a specialist or should I be a generalist? Is actually a really interesting setup for what we're gonna talk about today, which is what's the difference? How, how do teams work and what's the difference? Where do the specialists go and where do the generalists go? And how do you find your way into the, one of those teams in the right way? So that what's interesting is that our business is by far the most convoluted and uh, elaborate and um, diversified form of entertainment. There's so many different fields of labor that go into the making of immersive experiences in themed entertainment. Uh, the next closest thing is probably movies, which involves so much, uh, you know, collaboration and and so many disciplines. But we're like movies plus architecture plus, ho you know, hotel design and food design and uh, and master planning and landscape and all kinds of things. There's so many disciplines that come together that the real question isn't how do you organize a team. The real question is how does anything ever get done? Why isn't it complete bedlam at, at all times in our industry. There's so many, why aren't people just running around, crashing into each other, building things randomly? And, and why doesn't it, why, how does anything ever turn out well? Uh, and we've all worked on projects where things don't turn out well because they're not well organized. Um, but what is clear after many years of sort of evolution of this business is that the secret to a great successful project is all about starting at the center of the project with the right combination of creative thinking and practical thinking, or more specifically, practical leadership and creative leadership, being really clear about how the practical is being done and how the creative is being done and making those two meld together perfectly. And Figuring out how to do that is what's tricky and not super easy because there's 
it, it, it wasn't immediately obvious how to do it. And the reason, so to go back a way, so let's go back in time, shall we? Let's take a, a little walk through the, uh, through a brief history of creativity, at least as seen from the, from the theme park business. And how did, how did stuff get done? back in the day up to how it gets done now. And the answer really goes back to this guy, right? When Disneyland was being designed and developed in the 50s and 60s, there was no system. There was Walt, right? Everybody who worked at WED in the 50s and 60s basically waited for Walt to tell them what to do. And Walt would pluck you out of the, the studio at, at the animation studio and send you over to this mysterious building in Glendale and make you draw hippos or pirates and you would do it and it you'd make amazing stuff and bit by bit they sort of gathered a team and it was an amazing team this is one of my favorite pictures of sort of the original core of Imagineers I don't know if you guys have seen this picture but I love this and uh, um, <clears throat> a little if you guys want a pop quiz you can try and name all of the people in this uh, in this photo these are the original kind of core Imagineers minus a few who developed all the stuff that you identify with the core of what Disneyland is, developed the castle, the layout of the park, designed Pirates and Haunted Mansion and Small World and the Jungle Cruise and all of those core things that defined Disneyland were done sort of by a relatively small group like this and a bunch of other folks to help out. And, but, but they really took their cue from Walt so if you flash forward a few years to the 70s, Walt, after Walt had died, there was a big change at Disney and that, that core central leadership was no longer there and things changed and it became more about kind of management by committee and people would kind of work together in a much more kind of nebulous way and, and Joe can tell you and other folks who were back there before Joe <clears throat> that Nobody, nobody can actually tell you how it was organized. Uh, I think, Joe, you're the one that said, you know, they had very vague titles like art director, show designer, or uh, my favorite that you told me, designer one, designer two, and designer three, whatever that meant. <clears throat> the titles were vague. And I think, I love being kind of a historian of this stuff. I think the titles were vague for several reasons. One of which was <clears throat> nobody wanted to, piss anybody else off. Nobody wanted to be seen as having too high and mighty of a title. So everybody had fairly bland titles and nobody really said, I'm the boss. <clears throat> it was apparent who was the boss. Marty Sklar on the left was the boss. John Hench was kind of the boss, but, but there wasn't a real structure to it. And there didn't really start to be a structure until maybe 10 years later when Epcot was being built. And one of the first people to speak up and talk about creative leadership was this guy. Rick Rothschild, and uh, some of you may have met him, some of you may know him. He worked at Disney for, uh, I think, 25 years and did like 25 projects in those years, in, starting with the American Adventure and going all the way up to, uh, oh gosh, all the fi the Finding Nemo attraction in Tokyo Disneyland. And uh, he, he, please do not confuse Rick. Uh, on his behalf, I ask you, please do not confuse Rick with this guy, Joe Rohde. They kind of looked alike. People used to confuse them. They're not the same. Get it right in case you ever meet him. Joe, uh, Rick Rothschild is a wonderful guy, writer, director. And he's the one that sort of said to the management that they wanted him to work on this American Adventure show. And he said, this is a complicated show. It has a script. It has media. It has scenery that's moving. It's got timing and music. It's, it's going to take a lot to put it together. You need a director. And they said, we don't have directors you can't be a director. Why can't I be a director? Well, because director is a, is a, first of all, it's a union title and you might have to join the union. And second of all, directors are a, a corporate title at Disney's like a vice president or a director. And you're not, a, you're not at that level. You're just a guy working on the show. So they said, we won't call you a director, but we'll call you a producer. So Rick was the first person to use the title show producer, which started to give a sense of somebody who was a leader that you had to look to for answers. And it started to evolve from there. But meanwhile, the next big evolution kind of in how these things got organized came from the outside, not from Disney, but from Universal and from the many companies that came into being in the late 80s and early 90s, mainly because Disney would build a big project like Epcot or Tokyo Disneyland, build up a thousand people and train them how to do create theme parks and then lay them off. And those people would all go and find 
work either start their own companies or they'd go to work for Universal. And so the whole industry was born sort of in the 90s. And you got wonderful companies like Technifex and Garner Holt and Sequoia and BRC, uh, you know, going into business for themselves and creating the industry as we know it today, a big, rich, vibrant mix of folks. And I, my first sort of uh, actual job job was working at Landmark Entertainment Group, which created a lot of uh, projects for uh, Universal in in the 90s and 2000s. <clears throat> and from those, we started using titles that came from outside the Disney universe and we're taking titles from the architecture world, like uh, project manager and facilities design manager, and started taking titles from other areas like the advertising world, where terms like creative director, I think, came from the marketing and advertising world. And over time, we sort of started to develop titles that we sort of kind of understand, but they're still not totally clear. So here's our office today. Well, okay, not actually today. We do not actually get to sit in our office like this. This was a little while ago. But at our office, we use titles that are we think are fairly clear. We call the the practical leaders either show producer or project manager. And we call the creative leaders either creative director or show director. And it kind of depends on what stage of the project you're in or exactly what your responsibilities are. But that seems a little clearer. And, it, and it's clear to us that you need, every project needs one of those from each area, a show producer and a creative director to work together to make the project work. Most, so the, the way most companies are built though, doesn't really lean into that. Most organizations use models, organization models that take their world from old corporate America, all right? Organization charts like this from the, the tabulating machine company from the 1920s is typical of, they're still making org charts like this today that are complicated and very top heavy, right? Everybody's at the bottom, all the worker bees are at the bottom, and they all tear us up to one big boss at the top. And it's very much like a pyramid, right? It's a, it, it's, it, and with all the failings of a pyramid, you know, a pyramid is a whole bunch of stones holding up one little stone at the top, and all the other little stones are getting crushed under the weight of, of the stones above them. And, and it's, not, um, it, it's not empowering, right? It's, it's all about make, you know, playing up to the, the big boss. And we're not... We're not interested in working that way. We want a team that really play plays well together and really has fun together. So what we've done in our company, and I think you'll see other companies start thinking of it this way, we've created this thing we call a creative tree. We just basically flip the org chart upside down and we grow from the ground up and push toward the sky. The leadership supports the, the, the trunk, supports the branches, which support the leaves, and we're all reaching upwards. So in our case, the trunk of the tree is always a two-part trunk, right? That's where the practical leader and the creative leader go as a team. And they're literally, the it's two cores of a trunk that are interwound with each other and inseparable. And if one tries to dominate the other, the tree will split and not work. It has to be a beautiful marriage where the two really take care of each other. Uh, I, I like to say that in the best world, a show producer, a, show, a creative director, if I'm a creative director, I really should be think, spending a lot of time thinking about budget and schedule. And my producer should be spending a bunch of time thinking about how to make the show great, not retreating to our corners and only minding our areas, but really, really helping the other, other side, the other part of the tree of the trunk with their areas. So that dual trunk is what supports the branches and the branches are the the leaders of the different disciplines, right? The the chief architect, the production designer, the lighting designer, the, the 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 show writer, the people who are sort of taking the uh, create work, developing the creative with the guidance of the the leaders. But they're, these are the folks who are really developing most of the the core creative elements and are pushing it further upwards to create the teams who will actually build it and make it. And that, so the, the leaves on the tree are the people who are the really doing everything. All the real work gets done by the leaves, by the implementers. They're the ones who are reaching up to the sun, drawing nutrition and growing the tree. And the tree without the leaves, the rest of the tree 
dies. So really the whole point of this model is to support from the ground up and push everybody higher. And, and we would sort of feel like that's an essential way to think of leadership is not top down, but sort of bottom up, helping everybody go upwards. And uh, we're writers, so we have to milk our metaphors. So are, we, got, we should think about roots as well. What are the roots of the tree? The, for us, the roots of the tree are the industry, the all the resources that are out there in the industry that feed us in our work. So everything from the, the, the different corporations and vendors who make ride systems and lighting design companies and show control companies and uh, set design and fabrication companies to individuals who work for us as freelancers and organizations like the TEA and IAPA who, who all bring resources in that nourish the tree and help us grow better. And so that we think that's a cool way to think about it. And it's very fractal too, because if you're doing a big project like a theme park, you can have a ride. A ride can be a tree like this with a show producer and a creative director and, and teams and branches. Um, but it, in a theme park, you've got multiple rides and they can all be different trees. But that whole forest is like a tree that has a team at the, at the, at the base of it supporting it. So in, in the best world, like on Shanghai Disneyland, one of the best projects I've ever gotten to work on on a big scale, that was there were three people at the base of that tree and they worked together as a team and they pushed up to the branches, which were the land teams and the land teams branched out to all the people working on each each show. And it worked beautifully. So the, it, it's um, the, the trunk tr branch leaf model works great sort of at any scale. So now the question is, how do you make a, a good tree? How do you make it great? How do you grow a beautiful forest? And for that, um, I'm going to sort of turn to our team and they can tell you about this because I'm talking way too much. Uh, let's, let's hear from the, our, uh, two of our great practical and creative leaders, uh, Baz and Diana, who lead many of our projects at the kind of project level and keep pushing everybody and everybody upwards and forwards. So why don't we start with Baz, who goes by the name of Baz. If he wants, he can tell you his real name. And Baz, why don't you talk about, nah. <laughs> and Baz, you want to talk about your stuff? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm not interested in sharing my, my birth name. Uh, anyone who's met me uh, after 2002 knows me as Baz, so I'm pretty committed to the monosymbolic single name thing, the brand for a while. Uh, anyway, so yeah, I'm a creative director and uh, my conception of what a creative director was before I got into the business hasn't exactly lined up with what a creative director is now that I have been in the business. Um, at its core, it is a, a, a very creative uh, role and it's super fun and it's awesome. Uh, but there is so much more to it, and I've I've isolated a couple of things that I think um, make a good creative director. So I can uh, walk you through these these quick lessons that that I've learned over the years. So one is ideating, and this was what I thought a creative director did when I got into the business, and it's true. Creative directors absolutely ideate, uh, and you have to be able to. Uh, find and understand the right idea, um, not necessarily right away, but you have to develop a good sense of the right creative approach to solve a creative problem. And the role of a creative director doesn't stop there. In fact, it's just getting started because ideating is not a um, singular process. There's a, a complicated development that has to happen uh, to get an idea to be the best it can be. So I have grown to think of creative directors as editors just as much as ideators. It's about building the right team for the creative problem that you have. It's about leading good charrettes, good brainstorming sessions that again are always tailored to really specific and really unique circumstances given whatever your project is working on. And part of being a good editor is learning to follow the creative rather than dictating it and being able to 
um, let the creative grow beyond what you had conceived originally. Um, and once the idea is set and once you've spent some time editing, then it becomes time to let your team really be the reason that idea blossoms and help them. So that involves inspiration and support. It's about knowing when to say you don't know. It's about knowing when to defer to expertise and to delegate to those experts, to remember that you're keeping your eye on the forest while they're keeping their eyes on the trees. And instilling a good sense of trust and a good sense of faith um, can really empower your team to work with freedom and can really make those small details that make a project sing um, really come to life. And in truth, uh, the managerial part of it is picking your battles and knowing where you need to and where you can afford to push to get that extra inch because you're going to be spending a lot of time maintaining the creative integrity, which is a very diplomatic way of phrasing this with not a very diplomatic picture. Um, once the idea has blossomed, once stuff is starting to get built and budgeted, um, the role of the creative director becomes to hold the line and to maintain that idea. And you find yourself in a constant uh, cycle of pitching and repitching and reestablishing the baseline creative, why we're doing this. And it takes a lot to uh, keep all of these different stakeholders on board. And this is a way that you can kind of sneak in there and steal that extra inch in the middle of a VEing process or once the um, the budgeteers come in and try to make your idea a little bit smaller. You can use your salesmanship and your understanding of that project and you, knowing how to communicate with these people, you can find a way to get that extra bit of detail that's really gonna help later on. And ultimately what that means is that being a creator, a creative director is about keeping all of these perspectives in mind. Um, again, when I started off, I kind of thought that a creative director has the idea and then helps that idea get executed. And the more I do this job, the more I realize that we have to understand this process, this project, not just from a creative perspective, not just from a show producer's perspective. We have to think about the audience. We have to think about the guests. We have to think about the client. We have to think about the, um, the, the budgetary concerns. We, there are so many stakeholders involved in these projects we can't ignore their realities because then you end up with the fire festival. Um, you can't take them too much to heart because as the creative director, your role is the show. So you always do everything in service of the show, but good creative directors always acknowledge the reality of all of the stakeholders on the project. And I've, I've blown through this pretty quick, but that's pretty much all I have to say. Baz, thank you. And now we uh, know actually what you do for a living, which I, I never knew before. So thank you. Um, and uh, now the uh, on the partnering side, the one, one of the most amazing practical leaders I've ever had the pleasure to work with is the amazing Diana O'Rourke, who uh, has been in the business for long enough to have a lot of experience, but not long enough to uh, be beaten down by it yet. So you're just at the right place and is a wonderful person to tell you about this stuff. So I view my job as I'm, I'm hip to hip with Baz on all things project related. Um, but I think there are four key things that I need to keep my eye on. The first thing is organization, of course, right? That's what you think about with producing and project managing. It's workflow. What are the priorities? It's file management, calendar, Teams, how do you put a team together and what are their assignments and task lists so nothing falls through the cracks, right? So that's that's what you think of number one. But I'm also the keeper of the budget and the schedule and I need to be a creative champion. So at some of these really big companies, they're lucky enough to have a project manager and a producer. So one can keep an eye on budget and schedule and one can really help lift up the creative team. But in smaller companies, those two things combine. So I have to keep an eye on money and time, but I also have, to, also have to make sure that the creative is getting executed and Baz and the rest of the team have the support they need. Because 
the guest is not going to be terribly impressed if the project comes in under budget. They don't care. They just want to know if it's a cool experience. Um, the next piece is communication and diplomacy. So as a producer, you're often the primary, <coughs> excuse me, primary contact with vendors and clients. So you're the voice they hear. Um, you're the face of the company oftentimes, but equally important is communicating with your team. And uh, you're sort of a liaison. I like to think that I have knowledge that's sort of a mile wide and an inch deep. I know just enough to get myself in trouble, um, but I know just enough that I have the tools to talk to all different departments, right? So for example, the way I talk to an art director is gonna be different than the architect is gonna be different than the tech director. Um, I think a good example of this is I was working on a theater and we wanted to put a big sweeping staircase up to it, which is great. Our director says plenty of room. Um, so we go, I talk to the architects. Well, plenty of room for stairs, but where do you put the ramp for the ADA? Okay, it's a good point. Talk to the tech director. Well, there's also these show action doors at the top. We need a bigger landing. So it's my job to make sure that everybody understands what the final goal is and what the sort of parameters they're working in to come up with the best solution. And most importantly, it's about understanding people. As much as we like to think that people are gonna work in the same way, it's our job as a producer to understand what one person needs versus the other. It's, you know, it's not just budget and schedules, it's personalities. So for example, I worked with an art director and we kept giving him notes. We would collect the notes, bullet them out, send them off, we'd get the work back. 50 to 70% of the notes were captured. And I started getting really annoyed. I couldn't figure out what was going on. I couldn't figure out why he was ignoring the notes. And then I sat back and thought, he's a visual artist, right? What do we do? Well, instead of sending bullet pointed notes, let's mark up the drawing, let's circle it and put the note up here. We tried that, sent that off and Sure enough, 100% of the changes happened. So it's really understanding who you're working with, the best way to communicate with them, and treating everyone differently but equally. So lot, lots of stuff to do uh, to lift everybody up, but it makes for a better project. Diana, that's amazing. That That is about as succinct. It, pr explaining what producers do is even harder than explaining what creative directors do because there's so much of what you do is in your head and it's about verbal and written and mental wherewithal and it's it's not easy to visualize for people so thanks a lot um now if we uh if we had all night we would spend we would go up into the branches and talk through you know how the different departments work with each other but let's not let's let's instead go to sort of where you guys are at as next geners and the place where you're most likely to find your first uh, place in the in the tree, which is in the world of implementation. The folks who who are the leaves, who are the growth, the the the, the thing that makes the tree grow and thrive. And we are so lucky because we have two of the most amazing leaves on the planet. And as you'll see, they're one of the things we'll talk about is they don't just implement; they get to, they do get chances to do other things. But Esty and Lex are incredible. Uh, coordinators, researchers, and they also get to do lots of other stuff. I'd love for them to talk a little bit about how they approach their work. You're on, guys. You're muted. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> Are the slides? <laughs> go. Here you go. Cool. Yeah. So uh, I think a good coordinator knows a little bit about everything, or at the very least is a little bit curious about everything. Um, and I don't just mean like industry know-how because we're all huge theme park nerds here. So that's kind of that's kind of baseline and it's stuff you're gonna learn on the job. Um, the flattering term for this is being well-read. The unflattering term is being a trivia pinata, but it's all the same. Uh, by measure of experience, you're just not gonna be an expert in anything quite yet. So I'd say, don't be afraid to bring your hobbies and interests into your coordination work. I, I don't think there's anything you could ever learn that's irrelevant to this business. Uh, I happen to have a real big interest in marine biology. Two years ago, I showed up at Bizarc and started spouting random fish facts and I just haven't stopped since. So whatever marine, whatever your marine biology is, I'd say to, uh, to embrace that. 
Uh, I'd also say, you know, be a detail minder, especially where others can't. Going back to the tree metaphor, having a strong trunk and branches is absolutely key to maintaining a clear creative vision, but it also means that folks in leadership positions uh, often have to work in terms of the big picture. They have to be really economical with their attention and they don't always have the time or bandwidth to worry about every last little detail. As an implementer, you can pay special attention to the details in ways that others might not be able to and really make sure nothing falls through the cracks. Um, I'd also note that it's, it's a real skill to be able to discern which details matter. I mean, even you can't fuss over everything or you will burn out. So you need to be able to clearly identify what matters most to you and to the project. <laughs> um, yeah, this is about saying yes to whatever's thrown at you and just being open to anything. Um, starting a new job or project or even task at a company that you've been at for a while can be intimidating or stressful and approaching it with a good attitude makes it so much easier, not just for yourself, but for the people around you. Um, so this means not being above anything, but at the same time pushing yourself to try something new. Um, a lot of times I've been told to do something that I've never done before. My first thought, just like in a split second is, I can't do that, but I just say yes. And then later I break it down into manageable chunks and realize it's not that scary. And a lot of times that anxiety turns into excitement. Um, and the more you say yes, the more accomplishments you have under your belt, and then the more confident you get in the future. I think that that challenge is the fun part, and it kind of forces you to grow and leads to new opportunities. And also, once you say yes, um, be humbly confident about it. There's kind of a balance between having that confidence to do something that you might not know how to do, but still knowing when to ask for help where you need it. Um, as a coordinator, you're there to support the team, make sure things run smoothly, but there has to be that mutual trust. So it's important to rely on your teammates or branches um, for support, and it's always gonna be a two-way street. And you're gonna mess up, everybody does at any level, at any job, that's just kind of part of it. Um, and it's okay, but if you have a good attitude and ask for help, you're gonna learn from it. And as time goes by, you'll learn what you need to thrive so that you're able to help the people around you. And then at the end of the day, you're all working together towards a common goal. So when you can put your ego aside, you're able to think about what's best for the project or the company. That's great, guys. Thank you. The um, uh, And you are amazing. Leaves, branches, and budding trunks as well. You guys are incredible at the, everything you take on. Um, so, so that's great guys. Thank you. And what let's, let's talk a little bit then about a couple of other tips that make a team really click and that we like to apply and, and, you know, different companies work different ways, but this is something that stuff that we're really committed to, which is all about how to collaborate well. And, you know, we've talked about how you need creative leadership and practical leadership. But one of the things we really like to emphasize is that everybody has creative skills, even if you're, you don't think you do, if you even if you think you're just a, you've never had the chance to be anything other than a project manager, you have creative ideas and we want to hear them. And if you're even, even the goofiest creative artist has really interesting practical ideas for how to implement things. So we really try to get everybody to respect both sides of the process and really fuse them together. Um, and when we, when we collaborate, when we're designing, Baz mentioned this before, that, when, that we pretty much never do shows where it's one person's idea. That's not what we're saying. What we say is when we when we brainstorm, when we call, when we do a charrette or a brainstorming session, everybody is welcome. It is a wide open session, and and we love ideas to come from anywhere. Everybody's ideas are welcome, but what's important is you have to filter them down, and then it's really up to one person to be that filter, to be the editor. I <laughs> I really like this photo, Lex. Thank you. The uh, what one person decides what the what, uh, which of all those many ideas are the right ones to move forward. But it would be arrogant for any one creative director to assume they knew everything. It's much more powerful to get every ideas from the whole team. And then sort of everybody works together to 
react to them and one person will process it down into the actual creative output. Another thing we, that's important for this process is not to get stuck in your role, if you're, but to change around as often as possible. So at our company, we change hats all the time. It's one of the benefits of smaller companies. I think bigger companies tend to have a tendency to pigeonhole people in one very specific area. In our company, we, we change hats all the time. So in the morning, you'll be a, a uh, a coordinator taking minutes in a meeting in the afternoon, you'll be writing ideas and the, uh, and later on you might actually be leading a, a project. And that, that variety makes you more interesting and helps you grow faster and keeps it from getting boring. Uh, and the other thing that we really think is important is that all of us think of ourselves as students forever. And as soon as you think you know what you're doing, you're dead. Um, and one of my favorite examples of this is my friend Greg Pro, who I've known for many years. He's been at Disney for the last 10, but he's been in the business for a long time. He has created some of the most amazing concept art you've ever seen from Universal, Jurassic Park, and many projects there to Star Wars, uh, Galaxy's Edge, and, and, the most, and the Avengers attractions at Disney. Now, he is the concept artist of our age, probably, and yet he is constantly studying new techniques. Anytime he runs into another artist, he's asking them, what brush did you use? What color is that? How'd you mix that? That's right. Oh, I love what you're doing there. And he never stops growing. That's the secret to, to being, to a long and great career. So, um, so now finally, before we close out here, let's talk about, before we get to questions, is let's talk about where you guys fit on this. What's your place on this tree? Where do you, how do you find a, a role for yourself in the industry? And everybody has to find their own path, of course, but there is a place for you on this tree. And this brings us back to the question we asked at the beginning. Should I be a, a specialist or should I be a generalist? And the answer is yes, you should be a specialist and a generalist. That's the trick. It, is, it sort of goes back to what Ariel asked in that email at the very beginning. Um, this, the, the way we sort of see it is you should be great at one thing because then we can hire you. You have to have a skill that you are good enough at that we can say, okay, you're a writer. Okay, you're an artist. Okay, you're a project manager. Okay, you can run budgets. You have to have a skill that gets you over the hiring threshold. So be great at that one thing and really develop that skill. But be interested in everything because that's how you grow from a specialist into a generalist by, by taking interest in everything around you. And if you do that, you will get just naturally get exposed to all the pieces of the industry. And this is the most, like we said, the most eclectic industry in the world. And you'll find other areas you never even knew existed and you'll get pulled into those. And you may find a whole other area that you want to specialize in, or you may become more of a generalist and you may, and very likely will find your way from the world of the leaves, to the world of the branches, to the world of the trunk. And then you will have your place on the creative tree. And that's what we think is sort of the coolest thing about our business, that you can do that. So that's what we, <laughs> yes. So now Q&A is starting soon. This is our, that, that sort of wraps up our, our yakking part of the stage. And we would love to hear from you guys and hear what you think and uh, sort of love to bring the team back to field questions from anybody. And I'd also like to hear from Joe, because we probably got a lot of that stuff wrong. So I want to hear what you think. <laughs> so, how, how do we do, Joe? Oh, I don't wrong? think you got anything wrong. I think that's all very right. <laughs> and I hope it's not too redundant with it. With stuff you tell people all the time in the, in the program. Um, yeah, I love that several of the people that, on the screen are people that took my class. It's wonderful. Right. Lex and Esty are both alumni of yours, are they not? They are. Yeah, and and we we got the best ones. So <laughs> we're, we're yeah. really we're really glad that you guys are able to do that. Um, do you want to talk at all about uh, while we're seeing? Uh, we, we would love to sort of open this up to anybody who's in the in the house tonight to talk about um, the stuff that you're interested in. And if you're interested in in how to interview or how to develop your career or how to get gigs, now is the time to ask us. That's the sort of stuff we're good at. And again, we have probably the world's number one people finder, Susan Beth here today, who can tell you 
all the tricks of the trade of how to get yourself seen, appreciated, heard, and and advanced. Whoa, Kroos <laughs> says this is Kroos on YouTube apparently says, "What would you say is the best way to start out in the theme entertainment industry?" What are we supposed to click on that, or will a video happen, or anybody want to take that? Yeah, so we'll just pop the questions up on the screen, and then you can. I don't think there's an answer. Yeah. What's a little YouTube logo for? All right, anyway, let's, let's go. It's because what? they're all watching on YouTube right now. The, the, it's oh, a, cool. I'm not. Oh, he's watching on YouTube. Great. Sorry, Susan Beth, go for it. Yeah, I just I'm not sure what that means. How the best way to get the start is get out there and make sure you're meeting people. I'm meeting people who are just starting school in their sophomore year. It used to be they were waiting till they graduated. Now people are getting out sooner and sooner, just making sure that we know you and that other people know you and joining the uh, uh, next gen. And when they have the meet in person gib gabs again, where you get to kind of do speed uh, date job interviewing, uh, all the, everything works. Everything is a good thing to do to get going. Uh, uh, as far as how you get started, meet people, meet people, meet people. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's totally true. And I would, I would add a secret to that, which is, um, unlike the other businesses like the movie business or the TV business, we're, we want you, we really want to find great <laughs> people. Some businesses are sort of some entertainment world industries are sort of more gatekeeper business. And it's all about keeping people out of the business. So everybody gu jealously guards their roles. It's not like that in this business. We love new blood. That's what keeps us excited and alive. And we're, we really want to find ways to bring you guys into the new world, into our world. And you'll teach us. It's also a small industry, and because it's a small industry, you can get to know proportionally a lot larger portion of that crowd. Right. And, and so much goes, so much work goes uh, from person to person, and not through HR departments and formal divisions of companies. Right. I literally got that uh, Betty White job because I had was in the, my first day in my new office that I had rented in downtown Burbank. And it was above a Radio Shack. And I went down to Radio Shack to get a cord for my telephone. And there was a woman from your company, Jody Van Meter, who said, hi, Adam. Oh, you have an office? Hey, we have a project. You want to direct it? <laughs> That's how I got, the, how I got the job. So serendipities help a lot. And, help, and you can't have be serendipity it's, unless you, you show up. You can't count on them. You can't count on serendipity, but it certainly means putting yourself out there so that things can happen when you're ready and prepared or even when you're not. Well, like they say, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So just by showing up, you're out there and you're part of the community. And that's how you, you know, the serendipities eventually happen, right? Yeah, I think just show uh, up is a really good comment. And, uh, what was the next question we had? Somebody, I think you had another one lined up for us. We can talk about this stuff all night. Ooh. You're welcome, Jake. Thank you so much. I'm wondering what are some recommendations you might have for students and recent grads to be doing during the area of COVID to learn and develop their skills? Oh, that's a good one. Who wants that? Baz wants that. Well, I don't know if it's the answer, but um, I can tell you that I did not uh, come into this business uh, coming out of college and knowing that this is what I wanted to do. I had a 12-year a detour into uh, through live theater and television. And um, when I made the transition, um, I felt a little insecure about not having a portfolio and whatnot. And the truth is, this is such an interdisciplinary uh, medium and it is such a small, uh, a small world here that anything you can do that demonstrates skills that can scale up or port to the industry is going to be helpful in an interview. I think when I talked to Susan Beth about my career before I did anything in this business, I may have talked about like some comedy videos that I shot years ago or the TV show I wrote for and SB was able to see those, uh, that skill set, and, and she knew how it would fit into what they were doing. 
So just because the entertain the theme and entertainment industry is struggling right now because of COVID doesn't mean it's not going to come back. And it doesn't mean that you can't do anything now to build up your portfolio or a website to show what you can do when we do start to build these things again. I also often like to recommend people read Randy Pausch's book, The Last Lecture. Mm. He talks he talks about barriers to entry and why they exist and what their function is in a group. And uh, it, at a time like this, when, when it's hard finding a way in, um, understanding some of that kind of stuff, that the barriers exist so people can prove themselves, if nothing else. Um, that's important stuff. What advice would you give to students working on independent projects now, and how can they help contribute to and facilitate the design process? I can, uh, that actually, that, that takes us back to Jake's question. That's the thing we probably didn't address, which is the one of the things we're seeing a lot of folks doing today that is a great solution during COVID times is if because there's it is difficult there's a lot a lot of folks not able to get work right now and as you know there are a lot of folks have lost their gigs at the big companies too so so it is not an ideal time to get hired what it is is an ideal time to build your resume and your portfolio by doing work on your own or with friends that you can start to build up and show to people but to answer but how do we answer your specific question anybody want to tackle about um how to how to work on those independent projects and how to, um, how can they help and facilitate the design process? <laughs> Who wants to try that one? Good answer. <laughs> I'm gonna step up here and I'm gonna say, I think we have a couple of people who have had some great um, side projects. Lex, do you wanna talk about this a little bit? Yeah, yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. I, I would say uh, just try to, it, whatever work you do will be most useful to you if you can try to imitate uh, the structure of a, of a, you know, of a big company or of the real deal. Try to, you know, do it as professionally as possible and try to implement some of those structures of, of roles and schedules and you know, keep track of things and try to try to make it as applicable to the real world as possible so that when and also documentation, whatever you do, make sure that you document not just the shiny final product, but document the whole process and make sure you have, you know, dates, dates and stamps on everything so that, yeah, when you're done with it, uh, you have you have something that you can show someone and that really can can serve as a demonstration of, uh, yeah, what, what you did, uh, the design process and uh, how it could map to other projects. And actually on, on that note, uh, it's always good, at least for me, when I'm interviewing artists and art directors and creative directors, when I look at a portfolio, we don't wanna see the last shiny picture, right? We wanna understand what your process is. Are you you know, doing grabbing scrap and photo bashing? Are you sketching stuff out? you know, by hand and what, what does that process look like along the way? Because that to me informs more about how you work than just seeing what the shiny picture is at the end. Yeah, I think often it's about seeing the patterns of thought. So whatever you present, what you want to present something that documents the patterns of thought. Hmm. Nicely said, Professor. <laughs> Adam, there's a question there about cover letters that a very short answer will do. Uh, I can sure well, address that. There you go. <laughs> Thanks. Go for it. Kelly Lemos says, do you have advice for curating cover letters for the themed entertainment industry? That is Susan Bess, Nay plus ultra <laughs> speciality. Yeah, I'm going to give you a few things, and they're all very short and simple. One, make sure you don't send the same letter to everybody, especially when people do occasionally say, I really want to work at the blah, blah company, and it isn't you. That's always a good, uh, a good oh, yeah. thing. To, yeah, don't fill in the blank wrong. <laughs> right. Two, don't have thing, blanks to fill in. Really try to understand what the company is that you're approaching so that your letter, which should be very short and very clear about what you – who you are and what you're looking for and why make it so that uh, that people want to read it and will remember something in it 
that will help them say, oh, I should talk to this person. I should meet this person. And uh, as Joe well knows, uh, anyone who's uh, been in at USC when I've been in one of the uh, sessions there is have somebody proofread it for typos. Because even though typos shouldn't matter and spelling error shouldn't matter and all of those things shouldn't matter, they do because they show that you didn't think through how you're going to present yourself. We do make exceptions. There are people who we've taken in who had those things, but generally speaking, it shows a, a willingness to really think about what you're sending off that represents you. Yeah, and in fact, oh, sorry, super Adam. True. Oh, I just can say it's super true because uh, especially for a company like us, we, we revere writing. We're a company of writers and you know, first and we, everything we do grows from writing. So we want to know that you can string a sentence together and write something interesting, right? Uh, uh, communication is so important, like Diana said. Go ahead, Diana. Well, I was just going to say, you know, a good example is we were looking to hire somebody um, and in our communication ended up getting a very curt response back. And that response made us go, hmm. Killed them. If, mm -hmm. if they're willing to talk to us like that and they, we haven't hired them yet, how are they going to talk to the client? So it really <laughs> is how you, how you put yourself out there is very important. And, and I will say that uh, Joe trains his kids well. Everyone I've met at, in any of the SE classes has been really enthusiastic and fun to work with. And you guys you know, know how, to, how to be part of a community, which is great. The, having a rack in class helps. <laughs> Any advice for building portfolios for the themed entertainment industry? Portfolios. We love portfolios. SB. How do you, I mean, how do you build it? Is that the question? Uh, I well, and a good really advice good for one. making a great portfolio. What make, what make, what gets you excited by somebody's work or portfolio? Um, well, you're, I don't know that you'll like this answer, Adam, but I like to see people <laughs> trying different things, even if they're not successful yeah. at one thing as much as they are the next. I like to see sure. the attempt being made to try something that to just explore as much as possible. Uh, and when I see three sketches, it does usually not show me enough. And if I see 300 and you're just still in school or just got out, that's too many. So curate your, port, your portfolio so that the person looking at it has a sense of what your tr skills are. And if with some people, they'll show, for example, uh, artwork, or they might show examples of things they've done as, oh, I don't know, I don't want to say PAs, but just working in a very junior capacity on some kind of event, just like Adam was a tour guide. Um, that was a fabulous opportunity. So anything you do is a fabulous opportunity. So be able to uh, express it, whether it's by artwork or words or both, what it, or, or photo, whatever it is, whatever form, that it's something that helped you and is part of, of what you're offering to the potential yeah. employer and work for free if you have to. But I don't mean that we work. We do not hire people to work for free, work on each other's projects for free. We don't hire people. I mean, we don't bring people on and say work right. for free to get experience. Don't, don't do that if you, but uh, it, unless that's really important to you. Yeah. The projects you're doing for experience. Uh, we saw a lot of stat this summer of projects. We, we uh, sponsored the, uh, the tech workshop, uh, that had, was six different projects that came together over a five week period. And those teams were great and did amazing stuff and now have good work for their portfolios. That was, th that kind of stuff is terrific and people should be doing more of that. Should we go back to, uh, Kelly's? Oh, wait, sorry. I'm, I'm messing you guys up. Chris's question with regards to curating your professional image, how do you recommend using tools such as LinkedIn to convey who you are as a designer and get yourself noticed? This isn't bad. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I do look at LinkedIn. I, I am on LinkedIn and I am happy to talk to people through LinkedIn, but I, it, this isn't a corporate business. So LinkedIn is nice to just show that you exist and to maybe give a chance for people to get to see your name and a little bit of exposure like that. 
but this is LinkedIn, unless you're looking for a marketing or I don't know, I don't really use it for as a tool to find people. And that may be just something unique that, that I don't do. Uh, and I'm, but I do suggest that you're on it so people know who you are and that you're out there. That's really well, all I, I can say. And I, go ahead. Well, say, I'm, not, I'm not great at using LinkedIn for myself. Like I, I never post anything, but I definitely kind of cruise it every once in a while. Um, and a lot of artists that I've worked with will periodically post updates on their portfolio and I'll go, oh yeah, I forgot about that person. And so just by seeing stuff up on LinkedIn of your personal work reminds me of someone that maybe I wouldn't have thought about, you know, an hour ago. Mm -hmm. One of the things for, that for I always is showing up, it goes back to the thing that you guys said about show up, just pop up. You have to end pop up at the right amount of time, not enough to be annoying, but enough to, that we don't forget right. you. What I always say is keep in touch once you meet, once we do have a conversation, keep in touch. We can have later conversations about how what that means, how long to do it, but keep in touch. Do not think that just because someone said, I can't use you right now, that that's the end of everything. That is, the, that is just not true. You because so much of it is just people. about timing and chance, right? We might think you're really oh, interesting, God, but we yes. just don't have a thing for you right now. But two months from now, we'll go, oh, that that guy who or that that person who did that that cool model. Let's get them in here and fill the model. Right? I also That's recommend good. taking a ton of interviews for jobs you don't want. Oh, <laughs> right, because we're we're interviewers are expert at doing interviews, but interviewees are rarely expert at being interviewees. <laughs> How you sell yourself is a skill you have to learn. Huh. An interviewer it feels perfectly happy to interview 20 people for one job. So an interviewee should be happy to take a billion interviews and not accept <laughs> any of them as a way to learn how to sell yourself, what phrases work, what phrases don't, that sort of stuff. What a good idea. I Absolutely. love that. It's, it is a but great do idea. It and, but don't, but don't yeah, want to break but Anybody but these folks, yeah. <laughs> and there's one more thing let me add about that is this is a really important one. When you're selling yourself, just remember that it isn't about what you want and it isn't about your career. Nobody is going to hire you unless they feel that you understand what they need, what they want, and that you're going to help them and the company. So just please keep that in mind. I can't tell you how many people say, I want this. I want that. I'm looking for a job that will help me do this. And I'm, I'm just thinking, that's wonderful. I hope you find one. Yeah, we're Sorry. all service industry <laughs> employees, right? I want to go back to a, a question that Jack Stolro asked a little while ago. Do people transfer from other industries into themed entertainment? Yes. Just like yes. There. All the time. Everybody transfers from another industry into themed entertainment. We are the uh, the Roach Motel of, of entertainment. <laughs> bugs check in, but they don't check out. <laughs> because we're the fun guys, right? People come to our industry from movies, from TV, from theater, from video games, from architecture. And once they get here, they like it because it's fun and they stick around. And almost everybody here started doing something else, right? The Baz, uh, Shanna, Joe, Diana, Susan Baz. Me. Yeah. Me. Yeah. Lex and Esty are too young to count, but you know. you've already done other stuff, right? You guys have done worked in games and other places. I'm probably the only nerd who only ever wanted to do this, and that's all I wanted to do. And I've never really had a job in any other industry. But most of the people I know come from other worlds, and it makes for a more interesting business. Well, I think like this generation of which I include SD and Lex and any of the students that that Joe's been working with lately. It's really the first generation that has the luxury of learning this stuff in college oh, and God. hitting the workforce running full speed. Uh, there was no other way to get into this business as recently as five I years ago. I would have you, you kneecapped someone for the chance to get the, the kind of <laughs> class that Joe teaches when I was a kid. I, it was such a mystery, right? You had no idea. Like, how does this stuff work? No. I, didn't even, I didn't even know it was a job until yeah. I was like 27. It and didn't occur to me that it existed as a job. That, we hear that a lot, right? Yeah. We hear a lot that, that um, people don't know this industry even exists until they kind of, kind of come in 
by accident from something else. Well, what did, you called us the Roach Motel. I I I think of the. I tend to think of like the the armed services metaphor, where like you know movies are the army and music is the navy and video games are the air force. We're definitely the coast guard. Like we are. We are, we are I thought you were gonna go with space force. I <laughs> Uh, yeah, the Coast Guard needs somebody to kick around, but uh, <laughs> we are definitely in the armed services. We are definitely one of the branches of the entertainment services, but most people don't realize that. But we're also pretty rad, and once people do realize it, they, they like to stick around. Um, yeah, we did a thing years ago for a state conference. Baz made a, this great sort of thermometer gauge of the status uh, you know, status of different entertainment jobs, starting at the top with movies and then TV and then theater. And then I think then it got down to like advertising and then down to like, I don't know. Uh, mimes, mimes and accordions, because those were the two things I did before I came to this. My, yeah, the bottom two were mimes and accordions and then came theme park in terms of, uh, in terms of respect. Did, because did we're kind of- For how much fun people have on the job? <laughs> I think that's fair, right? We're we're the we are probably the like the least known entertainment industry, but the nice thing is that it means we're the nicest entertainment industry. Like Shanna said, the, the jerks don't come here. Jerks who want to make a trillion dollars and live in a giant mansion in in uh, you know in Malibu, going to TV or movies and kill each other to get there. People in our business. First of all, have to, you have you can't be like that. You have to collaborate. You have to be a Renaissance person in our business. And second of all, people know you'll make a nice living in this business. You can have a very nice life and have fun and go travel and have great adventures and put your kids through school and have a perfectly lovely life. But the evil, horrible, greedy people tend not to show up here. The cool people show up here. The fun, nerdy people, and that's why we love this business. Um, do we have any? What other questions do we want to? check in on there's a bunch of things that you guys are throwing at us which is pretty cool um, i think we should probably think about uh we can wind down i see one last one that's really interesting from matthew waller should we do this one last matthew says where do you see the future of the industry going thanks matthew <laughs> that's the that's the question isn't it so does anybody want to take a shot at that you know we're we are obviously in a strange and dire moment where the industry has been shut down, even as other parts of the economy are coming back to life, where the computer industry is doing great, the you know the social media business is doing great, Zoom is doing great, but travel and leisure, the out of home, even even movies and TV are back to work and are building stuff to watch online, but nobody's going to watch it in a movie theater anymore. They're going to watch it at streaming at home. But what we do, you have to leave your home to do. That's the essence of what we do is we create out of home entertainment and that means nobody going nowhere for a while so we are in this very strange moment where everything in our business is effectively shut down at least in this country yeah. so for students but, yeah. go into one of those other industries <laughs> get some expertise <laughs> And then wait and come back when we're ready for you. Right. Well, no, what I was going to say is the, the but is, and it's a big but, is that there is um, there's life in the old girl yet, and there's more ahead. We are, we're still working. We've been very fortunate. We are super lucky because just by happenstance and good clients and lovely folks, we have not stopped working this whole time. The projects that we're doing over in China and projects we're doing for Disney and other stuff – we're already up and rolling and have kept rolling and we've been able to keep our whole team together and stay intact. So there are folks who are working. It's not dead. It's just weird. And there is work coming because if I was a bajillionaire and I was going to spend a bajillion dollars on a theme park, now is the time I would start planning it. I know there's a lot of fear and a lot of things have been canceled, but if I was a visionary, I'd be thinking that now is the time to get a great deal on talent, a great deal on land, a great deal on people and start building the thing that will draw people out of their homes two years from now or four years from now and assume that it will be okay. And another so thing we're very like, optimistic, but sorry, Shannon, go ahead. Yeah, I, I what you were just, with what you were just saying, another thing that we've talked about on our team a little bit is, um, is how wonderful human nature is, you know? 
human nature on its own draws people out of their home and helps them want to connect with other people. Just like we're connecting with you guys here. Um, so the first chance that we all get we're gonna to wanna to get out there and we're gonna go have experiences in person with our friends and with our family. It's going to come back, it's going to be there. So it's what everyone on the team has said here, you know, just keep busy and and keep building your resume. And like Joe said, when it comes back, we'll be here and so will you. Yep. Yeah, go, go slum with those other guys and then come back. <laughs> and, and Stay, stay. We're still doing stuff, and stuff is still happening. Who all? Who's going to see Stranger Things at uh, in downtown LA? We are. We all. Are, we have one of our team members has worked on it. Brian uh, from our team has been involved. It looks like an amazing show. It's the beginning of a whole a whole new category of entertainment. Drive through entertainment. Life finds a way. You can drive through your. You can be the ride. You can ride through somebody's attraction in your car and never leave your safety bubble. There's ways to do this, and people are eager to have that entertainment. So it's great. So I think it feels like that's a good place to wrap things up. What do you guys think, Elizabeth? Is this good? Yeah. No, great. That was awesome. Thank you, guys. I would also like to add. I am also signed up to go see Stranger Things. So excited for that. <laughs> all right, we're all going. Not till no, January. But it'll be a reintroduction. But that interesting that it's going to run for not for three days or three weeks. It's going to run for four months. So that's yeah. A no, that's it was a nice. Day. It was one of the few things not sold out since, right. as you said, people really want to go to things right now, and there's not a lot people can do. So, so. don't give up. Stick around. The, the fun stuff is still coming. Interesting things that we can't even imagine. So thank you so much, guys. We are really thrilled that you had us here tonight. We had a really fun time doing this, and and. Mm -hmm. Being yeah, part of this, thank you all for coming and spending an hour of your evening with us tonight. 